This is the Rabwe Mokbai. He was a Nigerian artist who worked in 2D and 3D art, most of which were paintings, sculptures, and mosaics. Throughout his fine art career, he also worked in advertising, eventually becoming creative director of Lintas, a West African firm. He was my grandfather. From his arrival in Lagos in 1954, newly married, Imokbai proved himself to be a purposeful and versatile artist. He used his advertising work at Lintas to support his family, but also continued his own artistic practice and became a well-known artist in the Lagos scene. During the 1970s, a watershed came in Imokbai's career. He was tasked with creating the look of Festac 77 the second World Black and African Festival of Arts and Culture, a month-long city-wide celebration of blackness that Lagos had never seen the like of. His work for Festac was so extensive that Imokbai created a company just for this event, Asa Productions, named after his eldest son and operated from an attic workshop in his home. Imokbai's contributions to the festival can be broken down into three parts. One, the poster. A simple graphic design, well within the author's comfort zone. A black and white image of the now iconic Idia ivory mask, lit to create a striking chiaroscuro. Around this is the official title of the festival, and above is its nickname, Festac 77, both written in fonts that Imokbai designed himself. It's simple and effective. Imokbai chose the image of Queen Idia not only because of its beauty and powerful gaze, but because of the subject's significance in Edo culture and how unknown this piece was in the wider world. Queen Idia was the mother of Oba Esigye, ruler of Benin from 1504 to 1550. She was a warrior so formidable that her son gave her the title Ioba meaning Queen Mother, and built her Igweyoba, Palace of the Queen Mother, just outside Benin City. Unfortunately, the ivory pendant mask of Queen Yedia, a prized component in the Oba's regalia, was looted by the British in 1897. The Nigerian government tried to negotiate the return of this mask for Festac, but was denied access. Here's a few words Imokbai had to say about that. Because when the Nigerian government was trying to uh, bring this symbol in, uh, in order to show it during Festa, the British Museum wanted £2 million as insurances, you know, for uh, releasing it, just for letting us have it for a, a short time. And this I found terribly immoral, because in the first place, this item was stolen from us. It was stolen from the, uh, from the Palace of the Oba of Benin. As of right, it belongs to the Oba of Benin, and it should be restored to him because it is part of his paraphernalia and it should remain so, not to be lost or locked up in one little box in Europe where they don't even know the meaning of it. They only appreciated the aesthetic uh, attraction, the value of it uh, aesthetically, but they do not understand the spiritual value of that piece of work. And I think rightly that uh, that work should be returned. You can tell this meant a lot to him. A son of Ewe Kagusa Doba of Benin, Imokbai was extremely proud of his Edo heritage. So much so that he took a treasured piece of Bini culture and presented it as a symbol of universal blackness across the globe. Two, the National Arts Theatre. As a member of the Society of Nigerian Artists, Imokbai was among a group that campaigned for a national theatre and a national gallery. In the lead up to Festac, their wish was granted. A theatre was commissioned by Yakubu Gowon's regime and completed under Olusegun Basanjo in 1976, just in time to be opened during the festival. The theatre is a unique building designed by Bulgarian construction company Techno Exposstroy to resemble the Palace of Sports and Culture in Varna. Its sickle shape is widely viewed to echo that of a soldier's cap, a reminder of Nigeria's past as a military government. 
This theatre was to be the cherry on top of the new landscape that emerged in 1977, with the creation of a housing village for foreign guests, in a district that is still called Festac today. Emopai's role in all of this was to adorn the theatre's facade. The first of these adornments is a frieze, which wraps around the building. Depicted in this relief sculpture are abstract designs and clusters of black bodies, culminating in the centerpiece, a carving of Queen Idea, flanked by two sections of a golden world map. Underneath this are the mosaics. The theater has four entrances and two mosaics at each. Imokbai created six of these. These ones I see as depictions of energy or something cellular the building blocks of life, something that symbolizes energetic origins. Circles of red, black, blue, yellow, green, white, all floating in glittering gold fluid, like a celestial bloodstream. This is a celebration of sound. On this side are those circles from before, shifting into pointed shapes suggestive of traditional masks. These curvilinear shapes flatten out into colorful lines, emerging in this twin mosaic here, and this shape that looks like the mouth of a trumpet. I interpret these more linear forms as a visualization of sound. These two mosaics seem to be an allegory of the creation of music. Now the last two. An abstracted figure bangs on a drum and even further abstracted shapes suggest human forms in motion. This mosaic is paired with another, in which form has again been broken down to suggest movement through long curved lines and contrasting colors. All six mosaics show progression, from nascent life to the birth of music, to here, movement and dance. All the mosaics and the frieze were created in situ which means Imokpai needed a studio nearby. So he established an open air courtyard workshop on the theater grounds, which he continued to use after the completion of his work there. The workshop is still used by a community of painters and sculptors today. Works of his and other prominent artists of the time are still on display in the theater's galleries as part of the national collection. Three, the decorations. Another part of Imokpai's job was to create the decorations that were displayed all around Lagos. These decorations, in continuation of the theme, were giant golden reproductions of the Quinidia pendant mask. My mother told me about this image she has in her memories of a cool bridge during that time, all the way down the bridge's 1,350 meters were giant golden ideas. They were positioned on every lamppost. She told me of how very proud she was of her dad when she saw how beautifully he had adorned the city. I keep going back to this image my mother described to me of the bridge and the symbolism of it, which I doubt was lost to the artist. He positioned this symbol to connect Edo history to Nigerian history and to worldwide black history all along Eco Bridge, a symbolic bridge on a physical bridge, overlooking the shiny new theater that boasted a frieze that linked Idia to the whole world. You can almost taste the optimism. That's why seeing the theater in a state of disrepair, with broken windows, five floors left unswept, and paintings crumbling in the gallery makes the Nigerian government's neglect of art and culture even more devastating. My grandfather died young. In 1984, a few months shy of turning 50. I wish he had lived longer and I could have met him. But I'm also glad that he'll never see what has become of his labor of love. To be honest, I'm embarrassed that I showed how derelict the theater is to those of you who aren't Nigerian. But if there's anything the last few months have taught me, it's that I don't need to protect Nigeria's image. All our dirty secrets should be aired. 
I see murals around Lagos with depictions of the theatre's facade, proudly displaying it. But you never see close-ups, never the interior. It's like the government's trying to trick us, boasting about their beautiful theatre from afar, but never up close so they don't have to see the product of their neglect, the way they are slowly destroying beauty. I imagine what it must have felt like at the theater's grand opening, what it must have been like to witness the electricity of its first performance, how my grandfather would have felt seeing the fruits of his labor taken in by what must have seemed to be every black person in the entire world. I imagine all this, and it only makes our present reality all the more depressing. I know things were far from ideal back then. Not everyone was on board with Festac. Wallace Schoenka thought the whole thing was reductionist, and Fella thought it was a scam. In 1966 and 77, when the festivals took place in Dakar and Lagos, it was probably even harder being black but it looked like they had a sense of optimism that seems a bit impossible nowadays. It must have felt like they were going somewhere. And it sucks to realize that we've moved so little. Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. You are welcome to Nigeria. We are the best that is taking place here in Nigeria, in Africa. Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. You are welcome to Nigeria. Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. 